Good evening, everyone. Now we're gonna do an Ask Me Anything. I'm Dr. Twyman, a heart attack and stroke prevention expert. Thank you for everybody who submitted questions ahead of time. I'll get through them as best I can and we'll open it up to live questions at the end. So let's uh, get started tonight. Let's see. Good evening, good evening. All right. So first question, somebody says, is it bad to live off 48 ounces of coffee a day? And let's see, and one meal a day to just being too busy. What are the consequences? Well, it depends on what your health goals are. I mean, you know, 48 ounces of coffee and uh, one small meal a day is probably not enough to uh, maintain your muscle mass. And it may mess up your uh, metabolic flexibility when you want to have to start eating a little bit more. Um, also you need to know if you're kind of a fast or slow metabolizer, the caffeine in the coffee, that'll have an effect as well. So, you know, Caffeine, I'm not a negative against it, you know, as long as it doesn't affect your heart rate or your blood pressure um, or your sleep. But uh, you probably want to add at least more protein to your diet than just uh, one small meal a day. All right, next question here. Question about, uh, this is going to be about endothelial function, essentially. So the endothelium is that inner lining of your blood vessels. You got 60,000 miles of blood vessels. Uh, the major thing that uh, that endothelium produces is a gas called nitric oxide that dilates the blood vessels. Also, someone acts like Teflon, prevents stuff from sticking to the arteries in the first place. So the person's question is about citrulline for vasodilation and blood pressure. Um, so citrulline is basically what's in the, uh, the rinds of uh, watermelon. Um, it helps with the conversion of L-arginine into nitric oxide, but the majority of people are actually never actually deficient in L-arginine or in citrulline, they actually have an issue with the, uh, the enzyme that makes the conversion. Um, so supplement with just L-arginine or just citrulline typically isn't going to do everything you want it to do. Uh, you first need to make sure that uh, your body doesn't have an issue with the salivary pathway of making nitric oxide. You, know, you can damage your bacteria in your mouth by using mouthwash or fluoride uh, containing products. Um, so, you know, you can get pretty uh, inexpensive test strips to see if you have that uh, ability to make nitric oxide through your saliva, which is one of the major pathways after the age of 40. But most people don't necessarily need to be supplementing with just citrulline or L-arginine. All right. Nope. The next question won't uh, pop up. Let's see. I don't actually know what this is. I, I imagine they were actually writing fasting, but they wrote down, do you ever recommend stating I assume that's fasting. If so, what scenario, generally speaking? So uh, if it's stating, uh, somebody send me a direct message what stating actually is. But fasting, uh, again, it's going to depend. Everybody uh, has their own individual context. It depends at uh, which your uh, mitochondria really need to do at the moment. Um, but if you're generally healthy, fasting can be beneficial. Um, but if you're generally unhealthy, uh, fasting is putting a pretty significant stress on the body. Um, so you probably don't want to be fasting significantly uh, if you're not already healthy. Um, but I think a better term to really consider is just time-restricted uh, eating or TRE. That's safe to do for everybody. Um, essentially, just eat uh, daylight hours is the easiest way to think about it. But, you know, your circadian clocks, your 24-hour cycles, programmed by the light that enters your eyes and the time the nutrients come into your system, uh, don't be feeding your gut and liver 24 hours a day. So there's different, you know, uh, time should eating patterns, you know, where you uh, eat in an eight hour window or a 10 hour window are kind of the two most common ones. Um, so anything that isn't water that goes in your system, start your clock for the day, be done eight or 10 hours after that point. At the outside, 12 hours. Don't be eating more than 12 hours a day. Um, I'll save that one for the end. Um, see if that pops up. So, can you repair heart scar tissue? Um, if it's truly scar tissue, the answer is no. Uh, that's gonna be dead uh, myocardium that uh, is fibrous, and then the remaining myocardium and muscle around it is gonna have to kind of take up the slack. Uh, you can measure the amount of heart scar somewhat uh, non-invasively with a um, echocardiogram, an ultrasound, where you can see that the heart tissue is not uh, expanding and contracting. Um, you know, there's something called strain where they can put these little dots on it and watch it uh, um, moving. Uh, the other more sensitive way would be do a cardiac MRI to, to uh, quantify the amount of scar. Um, so, you know, there are some blood markers that can kind of give you an idea of scar tissue. Some called galactin-3 will give you an idea of how much scar tissue is present. But if it's actual scar itself, uh, it's not coming back. 
But there are times where myocardium is stunned and it may look like it's going dead, but it's just that it's in hibernation because it doesn't have healthy mitochondria to make energy. So you gotta fix the mitochondria in that situation. All right. Next question. Somebody's reading about a product called Neo40. Uh, does it have the benefits they claim to reduce plaque? So Neo40 is a uh, proprietary product uh, that has many patents, has I believe at least six clinical trials that look at uh, the benefits of this particular product in helping endothelial function. Again, that inner lining of your blood vessels needs nitric oxide to dilate. Neo40, um, from the data that I can see, there's two things. One, it directly makes nitric oxide in your saliva. So uh, you get a quick boost you know, shortly after letting the, the lozenge dissolve on your tongue. Um, it has organic nitrates in it. It has some other things that also help with coupling that enzyme. Earlier I talked about L-arginine and citrulline. Many times it's the enzyme, the conversion from L-arginine and citrulline is broken. Uh, the things that are in Neo40 help that conversion happen. Um, so there are pretty interesting data, especially with endothelial function, pulse wave analysis, that the max pulse device we use in the office or the endopad, that can show you that if you, know, if you have abnormal pulse wave analysis or abnormal endopad, and use a product like Neo40 routinely, you can see the arteries getting healthier. But as the question exactly about plaques per se, um, I'm not familiar with their data on plaques specifically. If you have some like that, send it to me, I'll review it. But the endothelium, you can think of it as the early uh, warning sign that something's wrong with the arteries. So the endothelium gets damaged, the walls get inflamed is the next step, and if you don't shut down the inflammation, then plaque starts forming. So if you were to have plaque in your arteries, you know, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to go on to have a heart attack and stroke, but if you also have endothelial dysfunction with plaque, that is a problem. That means you're likely to keep laying down more plaque. Once you start having healthy endothelium, you're more likely to kind of stabilize that plaque, seal it in the artery, and not have it cause you a problem. All right, next question. This is, uh, this is gonna be a smart one. So well, what is the number one supplement for heart health, please? Uh, sunlight, next question. So that's really it. Um, yeah, there are no supplements that everybody should be taking. Um, you know, omega-3s are extremely important, but I prefer you get that through uh, natural sources. So seafood is very rich in DHA, very rich in electrons. That helps, you know, the electrons help with the mitochondria function, but the DHA allows light from your environment to get transmitted into electricity. The electricity then goes to your cells. So uh, omega-3s would be the number one thing, but not through a pill form. Vitamin D, would also be very important, but again, not through a pill form. Going out in the sun, having the sun hit your skin, sulfate the cholesterol into vitamin D, then vitamin D goes to your liver and your kidney and gets fully activated. Somebody has a question about uh, saturated fats, so should they be concerned? The, the answer is gonna be a qualified, it depends. Um, yeah, not all saturated fats are a problem. Um, it's gonna depend on your genetic makeup. Uh, partly if you're an ApoE4, person, that might be a little bit more problematic. Uh, the ApoE gene somewhat determines how well you're going to handle uh, dietary fats. Um, you know, those people tend not to do well with high keto, high fat type diets. Um, but, you know, if the saturated fats are not uh, fried, um, most people aren't going to have major issues with them. They're at least usually neutral in most uh, studies. All right. And then here's a question that I honestly, I, I can't fully answer. I, I'm not uh, well versed enough in it. Somebody's asking about uh, low dose cannabis and psilocybin. Um, so, cannabis, you know, from a cardiovascular standpoint, there's really no significant benefits other than potentially stress and, you know, sleep. Um, but you really want to avoid the THC containing components in them. Um, you, know, you know, if you have a seizure disorder, that's a different story. You got to work with your neurologist on the correct dosing for that. But uh, um, the THC can have some negative cardiovascular effects, affect the lipids abnormally. Um, and there's recently say I think that showed that people uh, have more atrial fibrillation or have normal heart rhythms who were using cannabis uh, and were admitted to the hospital with heart rhythm issues. Uh, psilocybin, um, definitely not an expert. Yeah, I'd recommend, you know, um, yeah, I know there's definitely some interesting podcast Joe Rogan has on uh, psilocybin, um, but psilocybin can help with, you know, uh, certain um, PTSD issues. Uh, so I don't know any data specifically on psilocybin and heart health. All right, well, I think those are all the uh, live, I should say, all the uh, pre-recorded questions. So thank you for everybody who's been joining. Uh, we'll get to the live questions now. So welcome a few other people. Huh? Lots of people coming on tonight, welcome. All 
All right. So somebody's asking me a question. Um, I can't actually say that I've seen this, but you know, if I've noticed anything in my hypertension patients who've gotten the COVID vaccine, um, you know, the the way I kind of think about COVID right now is that it's more of a it's actually more of a vascular disease than anything. Um, you know, the the virus can actually damage the endothelium. Um, I have seen you know a handful of patients uh, post COVID, not the vaccine, but post native COVID having long-standing issues with their endothelial function. They're having high blood pressure. They're having issues with Raynaud's where their hands turn cold. Um, it's basically an issue where those small blood vessels aren't releasing nitric oxide well. So, you know, we talked earlier about Neo40. That's an option for some of those people. There's another product called Arteriosil that can help regrow the glycocalyx, uh, which is the inner lining of the blood vessels on top of the uh, endothelium. Some people might be able to potentially benefit for that. I don't think there's any studies on it, but you know, that's you know, something to, at least the data on for patients with vascular disease, it might benefit them. Um, but I've not seen anything with the vaccine causing issues like retention. All right. So what else has everybody been up to this weekend? While waiting for the other questions to come in. Okay, light the glasses. So these are the... Uh, these are the original biohacking glasses I got back in 2017, so we're going, uh, going old school tonight. So these are the, uh, the True Dark uh, Daywalkers. They're a little bit big for my face, um, but I like the, uh, the color, at least, of the lens. It does block out uh, at least 450 nanometers of uh, blue light. So these are kind of decent for a day use, uh, but post-sunset, I'll switch over to my uh, darker red glasses. In general, right now, I'm switching between, uh, I got some Emartech Wolverines and then um, Every once in a while, I'll use my raw optics uh, night ones. Yeah, these were the one that Asper was originally involved with. So I think somebody's asking a question about sunbathing. Um, the answer is yes. I uh, partaked a lot yesterday. Um, Got to build up your solar callus. You know, we were meant to evolve outside, so you know. I figure get the answer is how much sun should people get exposed to. The answer probably should be how much sun should they avoid. Um, or how much time should they spend inside? Ideally, you'd sleep inside and you'd live outside. That should be the, the real answer. Um, so I've definitely done videos in the past about you know, how to build up your solar callus. You can also look up Dr. Jack Cruz, just like Jack Cruz in a Google box and solar callus, and he has a long blog explaining all about you know, getting morning sunlight, preconditioning the skin, so that when UV light comes out later in the day, you're less likely to burn. Somebody says, lots of sun, peach and, peach and pull. Excellent, yeah, that's, that's what your body's meant to do this time of year. Soak up the, soak up the rays, build up your vitamin D stores. Um, you know, you're much less susceptible to the COVID virus if you have optimal vitamin D levels. Uh, your mood, your energy, your brain, all works better at higher vitamin D levels that your body is naturally making. All right, somebody's asking about wearing dark sunglasses. Um, in the context of all the time, no, it would not be good to wear dark sunglasses. Uh, the, the quick answer on that would be that it's basically telling your brain it's nighttime when you have those on. So you need your surfaces to match up. If you're wearing sunglasses outside, the light that enters your eyes gets to your brain and tells you, oh, it's nighttime. But your skin is seeing, you know, 12 o'clock noon light. There's a mismatch of information that's going to cause inflammation in the system. You're also going to release cortisol and melatonin off kilter when that happens. Now, I'm not saying never wear sunglasses. You know, the other caveats being, you know, if you're driving and you're absolutely blinded and, you know, you're going to have an accident if you can't see, put on your sunglasses. You know, if you're skiing down a mountain in the snow, albedo effect, it's bouncing up in your face and you can't see and you're going to crash the mountain, put on your glasses. But then when you're going back up the mountain, take them off so you're getting some natural light in your eyes. Um, best way to reduce oxidative stress without taking supplements, uh, antioxidants. So, you know, not all oxidative stress is bad. You know, your mitochondria, uh, your engines, you know, they're going to have some oxidation as they're, you know, breaking down your food steps. Um, you know, oxidative uh, stress, you know, sometimes is hermetic, telling your body, you know, what its energy balance is. So not all oxidative stress is bad. Um, but, you know, things that can potentially help, Eat a ton of seafood. You get a lot of uh, DHA and electrons through your seafood. You can also go outside barefoot, earthing and grounding. I've done talks on that before. You know, 
your hands and feet have sweat glands, so you have a better connection to the earth. You know, as the sun is a cathode, the earth is an anode, as the rays hit the earth, electrons are released, and if your foot is you know, sealed to the ground, you're getting electrons into your system. So this is the reason when you go to a beach vacation, you tend not to be as hungry. Your body's literally charging up from the earth. You don't need as much food electrons in that case. But if you're getting um, the right electrons, uh, it's less oxidative stress to your mitochondria that way because you don't have to eat to get those electrons. So what are my, what are my thoughts of uh, sitting directly in the sun versus sitting outside in the shade? I uh, definitely recommend doing both. Um, so, you know, kind of the, the early morning protocol would be, you know, as much sun as you can uh, get on your skin without getting arrested uh, would be ideal. Precondition your skin from UV comes out later in the morning. Um, but depending on your Fitzpatrick type or how likely you are to burn or, or how tan you already are, um, will determine how much sunlight you need that day. I've always you know, recommended people start looking at the DMinder Pro app, gives you at least that starting point of, you know, are you five minutes a day in the midday or are you somebody's gonna need like an hour a day? It's gonna depend on your context, you know, how likely you are to burn. Um, but once you've kind of gotten your daily fill of sunlight, especially the kind of midday sun, no, it's cool, yeah. You know, hang back in the shade. Um, you know, that's kind of uh, you know, follow what your animals do. If you're, you know, if your dogs and everything are going to hide under the porch, uh, that's when you should be uh, hiding from uh, the midday sun. Um, so, you know, wide brim hats, long sleeve shirts. That's the time of day to do those things. We're, we're physical blockers when you've had your your full share of sun. Um, question: So, uh, how effective is the blue light filter on your cell phone? Depends. Um, the majority of them, you know, they're the better than nothing. Um, but the, you know, if you Google uh, triple click red, uh, you can set up your iPhone to basically go almost all red um, and pulls out a lot of the blue. But still, a decent amount gets through. So if you're trying to affect your sleep quality by keeping your melatonin levels optimal and not affecting the melanopsin receptor, um, you do need to wear some type of physical blockers. Um, the one caveat is, you know, uh, they're I don't know if they still sell them, but they may, but on lowblueLights.com, all one word, uh, they do sell those old school like screen protectors. Uh, they're like flimsy plastic that are yellow. Um, I used to have them in one of my iPhones, so that when I used to be on call in the middle of the night, the hospital call, um, you know, I didn't blast myself with yeah, noon, uh, you know, type colors coming off my phone. So, um, so that still works. Um, but otherwise, no, still do need to protect your eyes. The filters aren't enough, but they're a good start. Uh, question about cataracts being more prevalent if you wear blue blockers. It's actually reversed. If you don't wear blue blockers, you're, you're really setting yourself up for cataracts. Um, you know, cataracts, you know, clouding of your lens. Uh, the, the lenses are essentially turning cloudy to filter out that intense blue spectrum of light. Um, so if you wear your glasses, you're much less likely to get cataracts. So question is, what are my thoughts on a natural redhead and sun exposure and eye sun exposure? So that's probably some things of Fitzpatrick type one, maybe a two. So uh, they're going to probably you know, turn pink uh, within five, 10 minutes of being outside in the sun. Um, it's still possible to build up your solar callus. You know, I've been doing this for a couple of years, so you know, I can spend outside you know, a couple of hours uh, without burning, but you know, I didn't do this on day one. So if you're somebody who's been hiding from the sun for years, you know, best to start with the morning sun that morning sun does not have UV in it, so you're not gonna burn. That red light from the morning sun, red light's always present from sun up to sundown. Um, you know, the other kind of biohack way you can see over my shoulder reflecting in the glass is I always have a photobiomodulation panel on when I give these talks, so I balance out some of the artificial light that my body's sensing. But you can expose your skin with red light uh, devices in the morning time or before you got to the sun, and your body's you know able to handle more UV before it's going to burn. Or if you do overdo it, then use one of these red light panels that'll kind of help her start repairing the damage that's been done from the UV. Um, as for, you know, the eye exposure, you know, hardcore inside, wearing some type of devices that uh, filter the light from your devices. Um, so, you know, there's different manufacturers. You know, you can go to my website, drtwyman.com. I have the ones I typically recommend on there. Um, you know, typically I block up to 450, 465 nanometers for daytime use, so they can be yellow. You know, the ones that are completely clear, maybe are black and 400 nanometers, you know, they're decent for glare from a computer, 
but they're not really affecting the melanopsin receptor very much. So anything that's completely clear is not doing what it says it does. And then in the evening time, post sunset, probably want to consider switching to the pairs that block up to 550 nanometers. Those are gonna be the red tinted lenses. Great question tonight, guys, thank you. So we're waiting for other questions to come in. Um, you know, I do have some uh, news to share, is that uh, one, my new website's been up and running uh, for the past two weeks, it looks great. Uh, so thanks Dylan for putting that together. My website is drtwyman.com, D-R-T-W-Y-M-A-N.com. Uh, Apollo Cardiology.com still works, but that's more my practice, just kind of where my uh, office is located in Clayton and contact information with test offer. But if you wanna know more about me and previous videos I've done, previous podcasts, or you know, brands of glasses or red lights that I use. Um, it's all gonna be on the Dr. Twyman website. Um, but the other news I wanna share is, you know, I'm definitely going forward with uh, having some health uh, wellness events this year uh, that will be in person. Uh, you know, definitely wanna do one down in Cancun, probably in November time. Also contemplating doing one down in Puerto Rico to be determined the dates for that one. I have a friend who might be interested in that, which would be excellent for you guys if I can get that pulled off this year. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to keep doing these talks every Monday night. I always enjoy uh, interacting with uh, my audience. Um, but sometimes, you know, to really get uh, the, the full deal, uh, I have to show you exactly how to do something from sun up to sundown. You can watch exactly what I do for my own longevity and health uh, promoting practices. So, you know, hoping to do some of those things on the beach uh, in the next you know couple months. Um, so just follow me on this page, or if you're not on my email list. You can always sign up on the drdwyman.com site and find out more information about that. All right, let me just double check, see if any other questions coming in. No other written questions. So, well, if nothing else comes in. I appreciate your guys' time and attention tonight. Have a great week. If you need anything in the interim, just shoot me a message. And I'll see you guys next week, Monday, 6 o'clock Central Time. Uh, topic, let's see, I'll look at my board here. Um, I might go back to a lipid one. It's been a while since I've done some traditional cardiology one. Uh, I've had some questions about statins and muscle pain. So we'll, we'll hit up on one of those ones uh, next Monday, 6 o'clock Central Time. So have a good week, guys, and we'll see you next time.